The Inventive Podcast, mixing engineering fact and fiction. Inventive. 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 Hi, I'm Trevor Cox. I'm an acoustic engineer from the University of Salford. Welcome to Inventive, where I chat to an engineer and ask a writer to create a story inspired by that conversation. Engineering is not all about big bridges, blokes in high-vis jackets or Victorian gentlemen in their top hats, as today's guest really shows well. She's Shruk El Atta, an award-winning electrical engineer. She's got an extraordinary backstory, including being an asylum seeker. A lot of material to work with for the writer Tanya Hirschman, and you can hear Tanya's take on Shruk's life about halfway through the pod. So enjoy this first episode of Inventive, which tells Shruk's life as fact and fiction. Resistor, capacitor, current, drag. My name is Shrukalata. Human being, a circuit board. Engineer by day. Resistor, capacitor. Belly dancer by night. There is a child sitting in the middle of the circuit board. Current. A child formed in Egypt, drag. but not of Egypt, not of anywhere. 24-7 refugee. Resistor, capacitor. Nice to meet you. <laughs> It's very nice to meet you as well. It strikes me that, you know, I have a very conventional upbringing for an engineer. I'm actually you know, a white middle class man. Couldn't be more stereotypical engineer. And I came from a very traditional background in Britain. <laughs> You're certainly not that. So maybe you could tell us a little bit about how you came to be the engineer you are now. Sure. So I remember one of my earliest memories, kind of realising that the people on my TV are not actually tiny little people living inside it. And for me, that was crazy how do humans make this and I didn't know that it was called engineering or electronics then I just thought it was called magic and I knew I wanted to be that magician when I grew up and actually had I been introduced to it as engineering I I might have never had that interest in it these kind of traditional terms always shout at me that I don't belong there is no space for me in that term. You have all of these connotations with the term and you have this limited idea and limited view. And I think that's a problem. I suppose everyone's uh, sort of job and has sort of kind of baggage associated with it. And the baggage associated with engineering isn't, isn't selling itself very well, let's put it that way. It's, it's not got great associations, <laughs> has it, in many ways. But I'm also, you know, kind of, because we are telling creative people that you do not have a space in engineering. And I'm just like, how many amazing creative technologies are we missing out on today as a society? Because we're telling these people with the amazing ideas that they don't belong here. I couldn't agree more. I mean, I, I think engineering is immensely creative. I spent my time thinking, obviously I'm in acoustics, but thinking about how do I make this work to make it sound better? And that's a, a very creative creative process mm. inventive 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 so you've got this really interesting diverse background having been a refugee sure like i said engineering was this magic to me and once I grew older and understood that it was engineering, I was like, okay, so these are the subjects I need to concentrate on. So I studied really hard and just so excited that one day I'm going to go and study this magic at university and not just be among all of these male students, but I was also going to be one of the youngest to ever study it. Um, and then uh, my family arrived to the UK in 2007. I just I didn't really know what was going I didn't really understand what the term asylum seeker meant it was the first time I heard it and then uh, they said that they're moving us to Wales and I was like wait I thought Wales were the fish and anyway we ended up in Wales uh, my adopted home now and um, I went to school I finished my A-levels and then I was so excited to finally apply to university to study this magic and then I found out that I couldn't. Not because I was incapable, but because I was an asylum seeker. So I joined a campaign called Equal Access uh, for Asylum Seekers to Higher Education. Very, very snappy name. <laughs> and um, right now I'm really excited to say this campaign has been successful at more than 75 universities in the UK. And I think there's only about 108 universities in the whole country. Um, so hopefully that the whole country will allow asylum seekers to access university is a dream that 
can be a reality really soon and I'm sure with other people listening now with their help it can be a reality. Yeah, I mean, it's, I think that's one of the really impressive things uh, reading about your, what you've done is, you know, you're campaigning for refugees and education. And, you know, you've got awards like uh, UNHCR Young Women of the Year on, on the back of this, this kind of campaign. So, so things are improving compared to what you faced. I think so. I think so. I um, I think um, sadly, since the Alan Kurdi case, um, if people are not familiar with Alan Kurdi, it's the little boy who was found dead on a beach trying to escape persecution. I think since that, I've I've noticed a shift in how people treat refugees. So my family were deported in 2012. It was an immigration dawn raid on my family home and um, I was I happened to be asleep at a friend's house that night. I wasn't at home that night and the rest of my family got deported. Um, I was the only person who was left behind. And uh, somebody filmed that deportation. It had tens of thousands of views on YouTube and going through the comments, they were things like, thanks, you know, freeze up a, a house for a proper English family. Go, don't come back. It was very, very hard it was really really difficult and I feel like if this would happen now I don't think I would be met with the same kind of harshness I mean that's you know it's I can't quite imagine it was difficult yeah but thinking about it to suddenly find your family has disappeared and you're left on on your own in a country I mean it was difficult and uh, you know it was just I was left in a country that they're not allowed access to and they were deported to a country that I don't have access to I'm not allowed to visit Egypt um so yeah it is difficult so have you managed to visit your family somewhere in between times or you just I saw my mum once since 2012 um traveling especially if you're fleeing persecution is not the norm as it is here if that makes sense it does I mean it's obviously not the norm at the moment but yeah normally you don't yeah yeah. (laughs) you know we're all doing it like this but you've had it enforced for a lot longer Mm. um, and that must be incredibly hard what was harder was going through the asylum process itself and it took about six years but that was six years of not knowing whether you're going to be in the country tomorrow not knowing if what tomorrow holds the six years of not being allowed access to university or uh, able to work or access to benefits and being met with people who tell you that you are simultaneously stealing the jobs and their benefits at the same time. Um, So I think that was the hardest part, being in limbo for for years. Yes, I mean, it sounds, I mean, I'm glad I've never had to face such difficulties. I mean, it just sounds horrendous. I'm glad you haven't either. (laughs) But but you did eventually, you got got asylum and that allowed you to go to Cardiff University. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it was it, it was an incredible opportunity. It was a miracle has happened, um, and you know, I I my family had been deported not that long before. My mental state was not good, um, but I wasn't going to let this go to waste. And the first thing on it, the first thing I did when I heard that I'm going to get my documents was apply to university to study electrical and electronic engineering at Cardiff. And yes, uh, it's great that you have because of the great jobs you're, you're down doing in engineering. <laughs> We've had to wait six years to have your talents. Thank you. <laughs> what a sort of kind of waste of resource for the country, if you want to put it that way as well. And, you know, we need to produce more than 186,000 engineers every single year, not, not in total, every single year, just to meet our engineering shortfall by 2024. And at the same time, we are preventing people from accessing engineering, people that exist in this country today, people who are good at engineering, people who are good at the jobs, we're telling them you can't access it and it just makes no sense no economic sense at all i've seen you say a true scientist always asks why can you can you unpick that for me so i actually i really remember this so vividly i think i was in year two and my science teacher told me a true scientist always asks themselves why and since then I've always asked myself why you know but why does this move but why does this exist that way why is why does this thing reflect light um and yeah I think for me that's kind of what made me into an engineer I mean is that true of an engineer they always have to be asking why as well um I don't think there's one form of engineering and I don't think that there is one trail of thought that makes a good engineer you know you can get that through different ways for me specifically that's what worked for me Tell us a little bit about what you do in engineering at the moment. You work for LV. What, what, what's your day I job do, like? Yes. 
Um, so I work in femtech. Uh, femtech means making technology primarily for women, but the tech I make helps uh, cisgender women, transgender men, and basically anybody who has given birth or has this sort of anatomy. Um, so I'm making things like silent breast pumps. Uh, it took more than 160 years to realize that people who breastfeed do not want to be treated like dairy cows um, or pelvic floor trainers. Um, but before that, I worked in industrial robotics. So I worked in robots that can measure things as small as a single nanometer, which is 60,000 times thinner than the width of a human hair. I've built a machine that can detect things like cancer based on electron quantum spin. I made um, a system that can help with eye surgery. So I worked with eye surgeons on the system, actually. Um, and I think being an engineer just means you can do whatever you want. I built a car and raced it. Oh, that's a really wide variety of things. You're an electronics design engineer. So what part of some of those projects you work on? Maybe pick one or a couple to, to chat about. Sure. So I don't just do um, design at the moment. Um, I work in a smaller company and there's a small amount of electronic engineers. Um, so we end up doing the design and the testing and the manufacturing. Um, so it's a lot more rounded, which is really nice. It's really nice to see it from start to finish. Um, and you'd like me to pick one thing that I've worked on? Yes. What, what, what sounded interesting from what, what I told you about just now? What's, what's something that you'd like to hear more about? Well, I... I... I think there's a couple of ones. I mean, I think I like your description of LV and, and how you're working on these really important things, but it's it's not such a glamorous side of engineering, is it? I've heard that before and I've actually heard it from myself. So actually I was approached for this role that I'm in now. I remember kind of being reluctant to take it because I thought that the tech at Femtech is not going to be as technologically advanced. And this is something that I felt I was unconsciously biased against. And just as a society, whenever it's something that has to do with women or women's health, we devalue it. Uh, and I feel like there's a lot of unconscious biases when we start talking about things like Femtech and we think they're not as um, technologically advanced or not as exciting. Um, so I think we need to kind of unpick what we think when when femtech comes up for example and also like i know that when this these products were trying to find funders some of the funders wouldn't touch it they're like oh that's disgusting like why would i touch something like that yeah that's really interesting because i've come across this before technologies which are dealing with essentially some effects of aging but i've never thought about the feminine mm -hmm. Uh, the female bars in that as well. Yeah, but it's also because it's a taboo. Like people don't talk about it. So, like, um, you know, the women who will suffer from incontinence don't know that it's something that's going to happen to them until it does, because people don't talk about it. And we're talking about millions of people around the world. It's a huge issue. We don't talk about it because it's taboo, because it's a women's issue. Like, um, I remember giving this lecture to young women who were interested in engineering and they told me that they wouldn't have thought of this as engineering and it absolutely it's not just engineering it's cutting edge tech exploiting piezoelectricity to achieve silent pumping yeah and i think we think about engineering often think about i know big bridges or whatever it might be but one of the complications mm. you have is you're you're actually working a really difficult engineering problem because you're having to deal with biology which is much messier and harder to deal with than bits of construction you know that idea of what an engineer looks like is really outdated and it needs to change engineers don't all wear hard hats or, or work on bridges of course that engineering exists too and it's important to highlight it but it's also important to highlight the diversity within engineering people engineer in their heels people engineer in their dresses the floaty dresses and they do all sorts of things and I think for me it's such a creative field I saw you talk about you know there's a special kind of beauty uh, when designing electronic circuit boards. I mean, I think for many people, beauty and electronics wouldn't be two words you would put together very often. So is the beauty <laughs> the design or actually is it what you look at the end looks beautiful to you? What, what's, what, oh, what? it's just you make this thing and then it works. But you also you can you can model it in, in a beautiful mathematical equation. And it's just when you when when this clicks, when you're like, oh, oh, yeah, I get that. It's so beautiful. And I find... Um, a lot of beauty, especially when it comes to analog electronics, because, you know, it's not it's not zero or one. It's it's beautiful curves. So that's what I see when I look at electronics. I see magic. 
I think it's funny, you know, when I was brought up, we would see electronic circuits around all the time because you'd take things apart to repair them. But nowadays you, you buy yeah. sealed boxes. So circuits are probably hidden. Yeah. So what are they? Um, so let me just describe kind of what an electronic engineer is because you don't have to be doing this part of electronic engineering to do that. And in fact, I do a lot of other things too. So for example, I write firmware. Um, so the software that goes on the hardware or kind of do the testing or right now in my job because I don't just do design. Uh, let's say I made a design and then a button needs live testing. I will literally design and build a robot that pokes this button as many times as possible until it breaks. Um, so you get to do a whole variety of things if we're talking about circuits specifically. On your computer, you use um, computer-aided design software and uh, you combine things like resistors or capacitors and all sorts of different ICs. ICs mean integrated circuits um, and they do some really amazing stuff. Uh, so it could be a graphics engine, for example, or a microcontroller that will be the brains for the rest of your circuit. Um, and then after that, you kind of do the layout of your circuit board on your computer again. And then you send that to be manufactured. A lot of people send um, their designs to be manufactured in China. And then once you get that, you can kind of choose to do the assembly here. So you put your, your capacitors physically on the board or you can get it assembled somewhere else as well. And yeah, you can do some testing afterwards. So is, that, is that a fair description of what a circuit is? It, it is. And I think, I think probably people don't realise how central it is to everyone's life. I'm, I'm stood in my attic here because we're recording during lockdown and I'm just staying around. Obviously, I've got a computer with me, which is full of circuit boards but I'm looking at my printer and I'm looking at my loudspeakers and I've got a scanner over there and uh, I've got my mobile phone they're <laughs> all full of circuit boards everything yeah the, the power adapters I have on my desk presumably they've got circuit boards in them as well exactly yeah and I remember you know when when I was a kid thinking it was magic I just used to take all these electronics apart right and I'm just like how does this magic work and I look at the circuit board and I'm just like okay so, so this does the magic what? <laughs> I mean, you're an amazing role model for, for engineering. <laughs> I, I wondered if role models ever played a role in your upbringing. Um, actually, this is something that I find a bit difficult to answer because growing up, I've had a lot of inspirations. I've had people who inspired me, like Stephen Hawking, for example. Uh, but the term role model for me is so strong and it needs to be somebody who represents me, somebody who's doing things that I want to see myself doing when, it, when I'm older in the future. And honestly, as a child, I felt like I had to be my own role model. It's so important to have role models because representation matters. And when you see somebody who represents you so much doing these things is so powerful. But also, if that person doesn't exist, be your own role model. You know, if you can't see it, be it. And I've read a lot about the issues of gender imbalance in engineering. I think when we think about diversity in engineering, a lot of us have started off looking at gender. Uh, but you're also queer. And I was it, it's interested, is... is is, is both issues the same for you in terms of people's biases and unconscious biases, or are they different? I feel um, I'm kind of privileged in that I'm kind of straight passing. So if somebody looks at me, they don't instantly think, oh, yeah, this person is queer. So I don't feel like I've had this kind of in your face what's the term, discrimination or being treated differently as somebody who is visibly transgender or somebody who is a bit more butch or femme and doesn't adhere to their gender norm. Uh, so for me personally, I've had a lot less issues with that, but I have seen people who've had a lot more. Yeah, I think it's something that engineering really hasn't grappled with yet and, and got a grip on yet. Yeah. Uh, and I, I must ask you about Dancing Queer. I did, I did actually manage to find a YouTube video of you doing Dancing Queer. So this is a beard-wearing drag persona you have. I mean, uh, what led you to do that? Um, mm, so when did I start? And I think I actually started performing as Dancing Queer about seven years ago now. I just remember dancing for my friends and they were so impressed because, you know, this is not something that we learn in Egypt. This is, it's not called belly dancing. It's just called dancing. This is how people dance. And just, um, just seeing how like, this was actually something that people um, were entertained by and were really interested in. And for me, it's so important to 
challenge these notations that belly dancing is a sexy act made for like men's eyes only by women when actually belly dancing traditionally was by men and women uh, male belly dancers were called khawals, uh, which is a term used derogatory today in Egypt and North Africa against LGBT plus men so <laughs> for me wearing the beard and belly dancing was just something that was so powerful to me and something so me something so shrook um, and it was important for me to use that to give a voice to the LGBT plus community in Egypt. So I'm combining something that's very Egyptian belly dance with something that's very queer, the art of drag. And with that comes dancing queer. And I use my shows to raise funds for the LGBT plus community in Egypt. And they can use that for things like um, releasing LGBT people out of prison who were in prison just for falling in love with somebody of the wrong gender, for example, or move them to safer housing, um, etc. In this invented podcast, we're, we're exploring engineering both through fact and fiction. And in your case, we've asked award-winning writer and poet Tanya Hirschman to write a piece uh, inspired by you and your work. And, and, and she's into hybrid writing. So she writes science, she writes uh, uh, fiction, she writes poetry. So That is so exciting. I, I, I want to hear. I'm excited because I don't know quite what she'll do as well. <laughs> Before I read you my short story, a few words on how I wrote it and how it came to me. When I listened to the interview with Shrook, first, my first reaction was I was just, you know, I was blown away by her and I thought, wow, she's just astonishing. I don't think I could make up a character who was as interesting and as passionate and as talented as she is. But then as I listened to it again and I started jotting down some notes things began to jump out at me. And this idea of, firstly, her love for circuit boards and the story of how she first developed her love for science and engineering made me think about this idea of a human being as a circuit board. My brain works this way anyway. I have a background in science, but I was never really cut out to be a scientist. I have such a love for science and such an interest in it that I have allowed myself in the 30 years since I studied maths and physics to take science and play with it and play with the themes and and allow myself to experiment. So for me, it wasn't such a stretch to think of this phrase, human being, a circuit board. And the other idea that leapt out at me from listening to Shrook and that wonderful interview is words. And firstly, she's not a native English speaker, so she by necessity, has two words for everything. And so there's that issue of language and then the language of science and the language of magic and these things, how they impact a human being's life and how they could, I thought to myself, how can this be used as a structure for the story? So the main thing was it allowed me a way in, it allowed me to start and I had to put aside my (laughs) slight fear about writing about not just a real person, but a real person who's still alive and is then going to listen to my story. And I'm very grateful to have been introduced to Shrook and her, wow, just everything she does and everything she is and everything she undoubtedly will do. So I'll read you my story. Human being as circuit board, human being as dictionary. Resistor, capacitor, current, drag. Resistor, capacitor, current, drag. There is a child sitting in the middle of the circuit board A child formed in Egypt, but not of Egypt, not of anywhere. What are you doing? we ask the child, who is very busy. Making something, 
the child mumbles. What are you making? The child lifts her head, looks us straight in the eye. An engineer, she says. Resistor, capacitor, current, drag. Resistor, capacitor, current, drag. On the video, the young woman with the face piercings, glasses and the enormous hair is sitting, soldering, in a lab. I design circuits, she says, for things like massive robots that provide measurements for the aerospace industry, all the way to tiny encoders that can measure to a nanometer. The young woman looks amazed. That's 60,000 times smaller than a single hair, she says. Resistor, capacitor, current, drag. Resistor, capacitor, current, drag. The child does not look at us. In her lap is a large box marked pain and three smaller boxes labelled mother, brother, sister. Slowly she places the smaller boxes inside the larger one. She closes the lid and sends the larger box spinning to the corner of the circuit board, then turns away. Will you tell us? we whisper. The child covers her eyes with one hand, her mouth with another, shaking her head. Resistor, capacitor, current, drag. Resistor, capacitor, current, drag. On the video, the young woman in the sleeveless flowered dress with tattoos on her left arm is talking, talking of asylum, of flight from one place to another, of Wales, the country which is not a fish. She tells how, when she happened to be out, her mother, brother and sister were taken in the middle of the night to a detention centre. Her mother tried to kill herself, she says. The three of them were deported. A few months later, the young woman herself is allowed to stay. Despite the circumstances, it was still amazing because, she says, but stops, stands there, stands there, then walks off. A few minutes later, to applause, to cheering, she comes back and finishes her talk. It was amazing because I was offered a place at Cardiff University to do electrical engineering, says this young woman in the sleeveless flowered dress with the tattoos on her left arm. I love it she says. Resistor, capacitor, current, drag. Resistor, capacitor, current, drag. If the circuit is closed, the connection is complete and electric current flows. If the circuit is open, the connection is broken. We watch the child sitting in the middle of the circuit board, making... How do you know what you're doing? we ask. The child looks up. Let me tell you a story, says the child. There was once a child who thought that what happened inside the television was magic. She thought there were tiny magic people inside. Imagine! She became obsessed, started taking everything apart. The remote control, the phone. When she put things back together, they never really worked. But, says our child, pushing her hair back from her grinning face, if you had told her that it wasn't magic, if you had said science, if you had said engineering, she would have been switched off. She would have thought, not for me, not for those who look like me, sound like me. She would have heard, you can't. Resistor, capacitor, current, drag. Resistor, capacitor, magic, drag. My name is Shrook, the young woman in the flowered sleeveless dress tells the audience. It means sunrise in Arabic. Like most people, she says, I was assigned a gender at birth and with that come gender roles. She was introduced to homosexuality in Islamic class at school, she says, where the teacher said anyone who practices it belongs to a really scary place called hell. Honestly, says the young woman, that's what they tell nine-year-olds. I never thought about sexuality until that point. I mean, everyone likes girls, right? Right? The audience laughs. Oh my God, I'm a homosexual. It hit me like a bullet. I didn't want to be that person my teacher talked about. Applying for asylum as a queer person, 
says the young woman with the face piercings. You have to prove your sexuality. How does someone prove that they're queer? Resistor, capacitor, current, drag. Resistor, capacitor, magic, drag. The child is storming around the circuit board, muttering to herself. She flicks a switch. Nothing happens. She heads to another corner, makes adjustments, turns and solders, alters and shifts. She flicks the switch again. Nothing happens. Again. The child walks round and round, tugging at her hair, talking to herself. We think maybe she is crying. But when we try and help, when we want to put our arms around her, she shrinks away. Leave it, she says. Leave it. It's not working. Nothing's working. Everything, says the child, is dark. If the circuit is closed, the connection is complete and electric current flows. If the circuit is open, the connection is broken. Resistor, capacitor, current, drag. Resistor, capacitor, magic, drag. I realise that as an asylum seeker, says the young woman in the video, explaining why when she was accepted to every university she applied to, she would have been charged sky-high fees. You get treated as an international student, someone who travels to seek education. I travel to seek safety, she says. So she had to turn down the university places. It takes the life out of you, says the young woman. When finally she is granted asylum, sitting in electronics class, she looks at the ceiling. This was not just the ceiling, says the young woman, slowly trying not to cry. This is the ceiling of a place I was barred to go to for seven years. The young woman does not just seize her university place and carry on. This young woman isn't the kind of person who does only that. She campaigns for equal access for all asylum seekers to have the chance for education. I think it's a dream we can achieve. She says in a video entitled Young Woman of the Year 2018. Resistor, capacitor, current, drag. Resistor, capacitor, magic, drag. There is someone with a child standing in the middle of the circuit board. It seems to be a woman in a bikini. We look closer. It is a woman with a beard, and we think of Hatshepsut, the female pharaoh, and we see it is not a bikini, not for lounging on a beach. It is the sort of outfit worn by belly dancers. The child, still upset, will not look at the young bearded woman who is holding out her hand. The young woman waits. The child flicks her switch again, on and off, on and off. Again, nothing happens. The young woman waits. Resistor, capacitor, magic, drag. Resistor, capacitor, magic, drag. Basically, says the young woman in the video, I belly dance in drag, and I do it in protest at my country's treatment of LGBT plus people. In the film inside the video, the young woman is in costume on the stage. This is my revolution, she cries. And she doesn't just dance. She raises funds to help people in prison for their sexuality because their only crime, she says, was to fall in love with someone of their own gender. I wouldn't be alive, the young woman says, if I was living the same way I am living now and trying to live it in Egypt. Resistor, capacitor, magic, drag. Standing in the centre of the circuit board, the young woman with the beard holds her hand out to the child. Finally, the child takes it. The young woman holds out her other hand and as their fingers meet, the board bursts into life. Everything is filled with light. We watch as the child and the young woman dance faster and faster. We think we hear them laugh. We listen as they dance and laugh until the light is so bright we cannot see them anymore. If the circuit is open... The connection is broken. If the circuit is closed, the connection is complete 
and electric current flows. What a powerful, awe-inspiring image to end that story by Tanya Hirschman. Engineering is all about making connections, not least because we're usually working in teams. But Tanya's story about Schrute makes me think about connections across time. I think of the quote by Newton where he wrote about scientists standing on the shoulders of giants. But that's true of engineering as well. As we'll hear in a moment from Schrute, she took a 1940s machine that was designed to diagnose things like cancer, shrinking it and modernising it to create something, well, it, it was so small it almost disappeared. So I worked on something called electron spin resonance. Um, so most people wouldn't have heard of electron spin resonance, ESR, but they've heard of MRI. Um, and it's a bit similar, but with MRI, you are vibrating the water molecules to know what organic material you're looking at. With ESR, you're exciting the electrons themselves and exploiting the electron quantum spin to find out the exact same things to find out what organic compound you're looking at. Now, when I started that project, there was ESR machines that existed. They were built in the 1940s, but they kind of were left unupdated. So there was this amazing, huge machine with massive magnets on it, okay, that cost like hundreds of thousands of pounds, if not millions of pounds. But nobody has looked at it and was like, hey, like, how can I miniaturize this? How can I make it join the 21st century? Um, so the first things we looked at was I worked in a really amazing research group was these two giant magnets that were one meter in diameter each and looked at the current technologies and realized, hey, you know, you can get the same magnetism in a two millimeter by three millimeter magnets. So that was a huge difference. So just realizing what's out there and applying it, uh, we've already brought that size down by so much. And then now we don't need huge power to power these huge electromagnets anymore. So everything else can be low power. Everything else can be miniaturized. Um, so I used a really tiny VCO voltage controlled oscillator to um, get these frequencies that I needed. OK, um, instead of these giant things that existed in that machine. And in the end, we transformed this huge machine into something that was one meter square and cost less than 300 pounds to make instead of tens of thousands of pounds, if not hundreds of thousands of pounds or millions of pounds. And, and these are medical imaging. So, I mean, I'm used to MRI. I've, I've laid in one of those big white donut scanners and had various parts of my body looked at. It's, a, it's an imaging process to look for cancer, is it? Uh, and other things. It's uh, more, what's the term, uh, spectroscopy. Are you familiar with spectroscopy? I'm familiar with spectroscopy. I wonder if we could unpick that. Uh, my dad was sure. a microwave spectroscopist, um, so I, I know quite a lot about it, but not everyone does. So everything sort of has its own fingerprint. At a certain frequency, mixed with a certain magnetic field, each material will have an absorption curve. And for each material, that looks different. For each one, it's got its own very, very unique fingerprint. And when you see that on your graph, when you see that absorption, you know what you're looking at. That's spectroscopy. Does that make sense? Yeah, so that enables you to look at someone's body and, and detect different parts. And part of that could be things like tumours and cancer, I guess. Is that the kind of thing you, you could do with it? Exactly, yeah. You can transfer that into imaging later on using software if you want. Um, obviously, where I was was not at that stage. It wasn't even a commercially ready stage yet. It was a proof of concept stage. And what do you think you've personally taken from having a childhood in, in Egypt, then coming to here, then having your family deported, having to fight for your position as asylum seeker? I mean, what... What do, you, what do you think that's done to you as, a, as an individual? And, and, and does that help with engineering at all? I think it's mainly kind of, it's really hard for me to quit. I feel like I fight for things a bit more. But honestly, and, and to, to, to be completely truthful, and this is something I've only been kind of open about quite recently, I almost quit engineering completely. Um, I worked for somebody who made me feel like I was an awful engineer and whatever I did, it, w it wasn't good enough. It would never be good enough. I might as well kind of stop trying. I worked for a bully, but I didn't know that this person was a bully. I kind of blamed myself. 
And I don't think that quitting is for losers, you know, kind of knowing when to quit is a really, really, really good skill. But that was not the time for me. That was not it for me. Um, and had I quit back then, I, I, I wouldn't be able to be on your show today and, and speak about all the cool engineering stuff I've done. And, and do you think there was prejudice in there against you as a woman? or, or were they... This person was a general bully for everyone, but I feel the kind of the surrounding process. So let's say you report this instance, for example, you're more likely to not be believed if you are a woman. You're more likely to be called a troublemaker. If you are a woman, you're more likely to be called hysterical if you are a woman. So the wider problem, the wider issue, the what made me almost quit was because of unconscious biases that we all have, me included. I catch myself all the time, all the time being unconsciously biased against women in my field. And I am somebody who people view as a champion for diversity and engineering. So when it runs this deep, it's just, you know, something needs to be done about it. Yes, I mean, it's shocking when your first thought, you know, un unpleasant thoughts can come through. But you have to kind of work to suppress those rather than celebrate them and carry on bullying people, don't you? Exactly, yeah, exactly. And, you know, I, I'm just, I feel so lucky and supported right now working in a team and, and, and for a manager who's, who's helping me grow. Um, and I think that's a beautiful skill and it's an important skill to have. It's an essential skill to have if you are going to be managing people. You need to be able to help your employees grow and you need to know what constructive feedback looks like. You need to know that it's geared towards your employees' improvement, not breaking them. I mean, if you could wave a magic wand and, and, and improve engineering in some way, well, I mean, what would, what would you do? I would like for a lot less engineering arrogance. Um, so I speak with a lot of engineers and all they know what to say is jargon. We need to change our language. Uh, we need to make it more accessible. We also need to change the default routes into engineering. Why is it just a university route? Why can't we take on more apprentices? Why, when we do take on apprentices, why do we look down on them compared to somebody with a degree, even though they've got the same amount of knowledge, if not more about this particular company or product? Uh, so, yeah, these are just a few things off the top of my head to change. Yeah, I, mean, I agree with all of them. I mean, especially the only route in is for a degree and about the vocational education being seen as less good if I could put it that way or less prestigious than the academic and it makes no sense because these people you know they've learned practically and honestly in so many examples I found that they understand a lot more what they're talking about than somebody who's had only theoretical knowledge through a degree looking to the future I mean what would you like to engineer in the future Hmm. I would really love to do more that will kind of save us from climate catastrophe or, or just my, my favorite part of my job is when I look at something, point at it and be like, hey, you know, I made that. You know, I designed that. So I'd love to design a lot more things that are used by more people, something that's popular, like the iPhone, maybe. Um and uh, I'd love to do things that maybe go out to outer space. Wow. Yeah, I, th I think you're, you're dead right with engineering. It's the, I made that. Yeah, be able to point at something. In my case, it's a piece of acoustic technology. Go, I made that. It's quite a, a real special feel. Um, and I think it's interesting you mention outer space and you mention climate catastrophe. Because I think, I think with, with climate change, people think that's a scientific thing. But in the end... There's going to have to be a lot of engineering to solve that problem, isn't there? And we don't do anything on our own, OK? So even in engineering, you're working with other engineers, you're working with other scientists, you're working with data scientists, uh, you're working with artists to make your product look nice, to make it so that other people want to buy it, for example. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's not going to be one thing ever. I mean, your early, just dialing back slightly, I mean, your early life was in Egypt. I mean, presumably there isn't a cultural expectation that women will become en engineers in Egypt, or am I saying a stereotype that isn't correct? Uh, it's actually, I feel like there are things we can learn from uh, countries like Egypt because the uptake for engineering is a lot higher than here. So it seems pretty evenly split. Right now in the UK, it's 12% women. 
up from 8% when I started studying in 2013. So it's very, very, very slow progress. Um, and we are the lowest in Europe. Well, we're not in Europe any longer, but let's just say. <laughs> but when it comes to getting a job in engineering in Egypt, that's where the split becomes really bad and actually almost non-existent for women um, from my experience. I think it's because of cultural traditions that the man is is the main provider and men should always get priority to jobs, which is obviously absurd. Um, but not that long ago in this country, that was the norm too. Yeah, I mean, it always amazes me how slowly the gender prejudice in Britain is gradually waning, but how long its half-life is, I mean, how long it goes on for. We've just had 100 years of the women's vote, wasn't it, last year or the year before? And yet still, mm, mm. you look at, say, FTSE 100 index CEOs and vast majority of those are still men. It's just amazing how long yeah. it's taking to deal with this. Yeah, I think the figure is, what, 6% um, women? And, and that figure kind of was being celebrated this year because it's the highest it's ever been. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> well done, us. <laughs> so if, if I was to ask you if, if, if I could give you a superpower by some miracle down this... Um, Zoom call. What would it be and why? Honestly, being an engineer is my superpower. I always say this, if you've seen me do a talk before, that's what I say, because I get to do whatever I want. I can make a plane. I've built a car and raced it. I've built a machine that can detect cancer. I Right now, I'm transforming people's lives for a living. Um, yeah, it's it's incredible. And, you know, I hope other people see that and it can be your superpower too. If the circuit is open, the connection is broken. If the circuit is closed, the connection is complete and electric current flows. So that was the first ever edition of the Invented Podcast and it was recorded remotely during lockdown. Now it's so exciting for me because two years ago I had this idea of mixing fact and fiction to tell the story of engineering better. And there we have it. I'd love to know if you think that mixing of fact and fiction worked for you. You could go to our website www.inventedpodcast.com or alternatively find us on the socials. It'd be great if you could follow us and also spread the word. We're exploring a different engineering discipline next time on Inventive with structural engineer Roma Agaral. We chat about her work on the Shard and have a frank discussion about her personal experiences of engineering. Roma's story inspired author CM Taylor to create a great tale with a wonderful character, a concrete Banksy. Inventive. Now this podcast wouldn't have happened without a great team, so thanks to all of them. We have Anna Scott Brown and Adam Fowler who were the producers. We have music which was composed and performed by Brendan Williams and animations by Annabeth Robinson. Multi-platform and social media content was directed by Jill Davis. As I record this remotely in lockdown, curriculum and career materials are being developed by NU STEM at Northumbria University. When they're ready, we'll have links up on www.inventedpodcast.com. The Invented Project is funded by the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council and the podcast is an overtone production. So it's goodbye from me, until the next time, acoustical engineer at the University of Salford, broadcaster and writer Professor Trevor Cox. The Inventive Podcast, mixing engineering fact and fiction fiction.